Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is that time to study God's word together. So would you please take your Bibles, your devices, and would you go with me to Romans chapter 12 today, if you're not already there. <clears throat> we started last week into this last main section of Romans. Um, you can see this on the back of your handout. Before, prior to the conclusion of this book, as we find in chapter 15, uh, going into 16, we have this last main section talking about exactly what is on the screen in front of you right now. Gospel transformation. We introduced this last week. This is the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ is sufficient not just to change your eternal standing before God, it is sufficient to guide us, to guard us, and to completely transform every area of our lives. That is what Romans 12 through 15 is all about. It is theology with shoes on. It is the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ and theology is incredibly practical. It reaches into every single facet of our lives. So last week we started into Romans chapter 12. We got held up in Romans chapter 12 verse one. Barely made it through the first verse, and today we will, get, we will travel all the way deep into Romans 12 by making it into verse 2. <laughs> so I hope your heart is prepared. What a dynamic passage. What an amazing coupling of verses that start off this whole section. If you would go with me now in your Bibles, if your eyes would find this verse Verse 1, I will read this if you would follow along as I read this. We'll read verses 1 and 2, and we will jump right into uh, the key truth and the study that we had started into last week. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living what? Sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What is this? What is this? wonderful section of verses, these two verses, this paragraph as it were. What is this? Well, as we started off last week, we observed this key truth. I think you could take these two verses and kind of summarize it down to a key truth. And it would have to be something like this. Because of the gospel, okay? How does Paul title the gospel in these verses? It is the mercies of God. We have seen the mercies of God unpacked all the way through the book of Romans thus far. Romans 1 through 11. If you question about the mercies of God, then our minds have got to run to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, that clearly shows us the holy wrath, the just wrath of a sovereign God. But then to find his mercy and kindness expressed in the good news. So, because of the gospel, our personal worship is to be radically transformed. So, last week we talked for probably 10, 15 minutes on this concept of worship. I won't go back and review all that we talked about, but what a wonderful word in the scriptures. In our minds, sometimes we go to a sacred place or a sacred time. Certainly, in the Old Testament, traveling into the New Testament, there were sacred times and sacred places. But when you go to the scriptures, you find very clearly that this is not, this is not the essence of all that worship is. Worship is, into, is to involve everything we do, anywhere and everywhere. Our entire beings are to be consumed with worship. Well... Last week we talked about this worship being whole life adoration and consecration of God. 
This worship meaning ascribing worth to God through an entire life of, here's a couple words, reverence, submission, dedication. Last week I mentioned one of my mentors, a godly man who would often reference this worship. And here's how he would define this. When all that I am points to all that he is, that is worship. Everything about me is pointing to how amazing he is. Again, sure, worship is expressed in corporate gatherings and enjoyed in private times of devotion, but the essence of true biblical worship is that it is experienced with our entire beings. Worship is not just experienced, as we just mentioned, in sacred places and in sacred times, but through our entire lives as we function in the midst of a broken, sin-cursed world. And that, my friends, is the transition of this passage. In the Old Testament, where would you go to worship? I'm mean, sure you'd go to your, you'd worship together and you'd study in your synagogues and you'd, you'd go to your, uh, you'd worship God on your own with your family and, and you would enjoy the Sabbath and you would enjoy the seders and you would spend time worshiping God. But corporately and technically, you would go a couple times a year to the temple mount or the tabernacle to enjoy worship. My friends, this is the transition of the New Testament because now, what does Paul say very clearly in 1 Corinthians? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, worship, glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are his. Thus, when we come to the New Testament, we find this worship is to be enjoyed. It is to be experienced with every thought, every word, every attitude, every action, every reaction. Paul's point is that because of the gospel, our worship is to be radically transformed. So we looked at that last week. But in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul describes this. And I want us to start by just briefly mentioning this. His appeal. There it is right there. The primary appeal. How does he talk of this worship? What is the main point of these two verses? Worship, yes, transform worship, but here is his primary appeal. Let's just look at this very quickly. Verse one, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Some of your translations will say your uh, logical or rational service. Same concept. How do we show that we have been changed by God's grace, redeemed by every choice we make every single day. This is our logical worship that we place ourselves. We worship by placing ourselves as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God. So just as in the New Testament church of Rome, as we read these texts, probably these Old Testament altars, as we looked at last week, may come to your mind. The point is very clear. As believers transformed by the gospel, our entire existence is to be lived out in consecration to God. If you put it this way, we are to live on the altar of consecration. Not just occasionally go to the altar of consecration, we are to live on the altar of consecration. And this, bless you, this is our logical worship. Why is this logical? I don't know if this has been on your mind this week. I I can't get this off my mind, the mercies of God. Why is this logical worship? Because he says it with one phrase here, by the mercies of God. Just, I mean, the foundation for this entire discussion is what has been laid through all of the book of Romans so far. And here it is. God has not given us the Romans 118 wrath that we deserve. Furthermore, then this is, this is what just blows my mind. The wrath reserved to me went somewhere. Where did it go? To the cross of Jesus Christ. Why does Every choice I make through my week matter. Every action, every reaction, every word. It's because of this. 
the mercies of God, Jesus Christ took my wrath on himself on the cross that I might have a relationship with this God. This is the appeal. This is the basis. The biblical fact is God withheld his wrath for me and placed it fully on Christ on the cross. And because of this, my personal whole life worship must be radically transformed. But then we come to this question practically, how? How do we do this? This is what we closed out with last week. In our minds, we're constantly engaging in, how does this look? When you come to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and you get to the end of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it's almost like we're in full agreement, like, yes, yes, yes. I'm ready to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is my logical worship. And then very practically, it's like, yeah, but... Now what? What do I do? Well, that's where, Rome, uh, that's where Paul goes in Romans 12 through 15, but he starts somewhere. He starts up here. Getting our thinking right before we get our actions right. And so this is where we find this wonderful verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your what? Mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right, so what are we looking at in this one verse? In this one verse, we find two imperatives. These are commands. These are the basic directives. So if you look at your page there, practical directives, that is what we are talking about one right now in the form of two imperatives. I just showed you a picture up there. I'll get to this in just a minute. It just briefly went by. To me, one of the most curious. You know, there's cultural, cultural norms that you come across. One of the most curious. Awkward. I don't, I don't know what way to describe this. Troubling. <laughs> cultural norms in human history is one that existed for a thousand years in China. This is known as foot binding. Have you ever heard about this? Probably most of us have. Blows my mind for a thousand years, generation after generation, in this cultural norm, what went on? I mean, this is called, these are called lotus shoes. And these, these, these Chinese women, from the time they were infants, little ones, their feet would be broken. It was a painful process. Broken and shaped and wrapped so tightly because an expression of beauty in this Chinese culture with these tiny little feet that would fit in these tiny little shoes. I mean, this isn't one of those cultural norms that just came and went. It stayed for like a thousand years from the 10th century, even up till, I mean, they say it might even exist to this day, but it was done away with most likely about 20, 30 years ago. This You take this foot and just over time, from the time they're an infant, you break it and you reform it all the way through their life. This would mess up their entire function. They could not function well. Why? Because their foot had been conformed to this shoe. Okay, when we, this is a ridiculous illustration for those of you like my daughter who can't stand the sight of feet, who is looking at her phone right now because she cannot look at this right picture, We will move on to another illustration in just a minute. Nonetheless, when you look at this, you find the concept of being conformed to something, taking the shape, shaping something your entire life. Well, this is the exact same sense of where we're going with this verse. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. If you want to think of other, maybe less disgusting um, illustrations, this might be one. This is near and dear to our hearts, all those Christmas cheermeister moms that are out there ready to go. You're about to go into turbo mode. You just cannot wait till Thanksgiving is over. So you can, maybe you've already done. How many of you already set up your Christmas tree? 
we do have some takers already here. So you've already fast in turbo mode of Christmas, all right? But so, for some of you in this room, part of the Christmas festivities involves this right here. It is taking, making this Christmas dough, taking these little cut, cutters or whatever they call them and placing them into the dough, cutting out and conforming this, putting it in the oven, and there you have your Christmas cookie ready to be decorated. Okay, this is the concept of conforming. You've taken this dough and you've conformed it to the image of this cuttery. For those in this room, these dudes that could care less about the making of the cookies, just the consumption of the cookies, um, this illustration might mean something more to you. Dudes, as you think about your life and you think about the time you spent laying cement, some of you have probably done this in your lives, I worked for a short amount of time on a, uh, over Christmas with one of the hardest workers I knew, a masonry worker uh, who, who in Colorado would lay uh, basements. And we'd put these forms together and lay these massive basements. One of the hardest jobs I've ever done in my life, especially the day when you had to strip off the panels and carry them to the truck. Like, ah, it was good hard work. What you're doing is you're taking these forms, you're setting them up, pouring the cement, all of it to make this image conform to the design you've made. Just like in this sidewalk. My friends, this is the concept of this word conform. Conform. I go back here to this word. Do not be conformed. Paul directive here to the people who are worshiping as living sacrifices is this. Don't take on the shape. Don't be conformed to the world. Okay, so if this is an imperative in our Bible study today, we need to probably figure out what this world is talking about. <laughs> Don't be conformed. This is the command. Don't be conformed to the world. So what is this world? When you think of this world, we need to think of it in terms of this age. Very practically, it is the self-consumed priorities of this present godless age. I'm gonna say that again a little slower. It is the self-consumed priorities of this godless age. It is a present mindset that is consumed with man's values over God's values. Did you catch that? Do we not see this now? We'll get to that in just a minute. Even if acts of kindness are shown occasionally in the world we live in, the motivation of this age is exclusively what? Self-consumed. We do this to advance ourselves. It is based on my value and what will benefit me most. That is the mentality of the present age that Paul is talking of here. Um, in our minds, probably we're going right now to some other texts. Even though it's a different Greek word, John talks of this. You remember this in 1 John 2? He says, uh, all that is in the world. Uh, he says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, the pride of life. Do you remember this? All of those things are dialing in on one entity. That is me. <laughs> that is a different Greek word, but the same concept. James uses a different Greek word as well. He uses the word, this word in James chapter 4, verse 4, when he says, you adulterous people. That means you've left your love that you should have, and you are loving something else. You have left your love for God and you're loving you. That's how he describes the present world. Here's what he says. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you see in the scriptures how important this concept of do not be conformed to the world is? This does not mean we seek to be irrelevant in culture. I mean, you, you understand through history, and I'm not going to go into this, you can track through history how some have responded to this. What have they do, done to respond to this? Oh, they go build themselves a shelter up on the top of a mountain. <laughs> By the way, that sounds intriguing sometimes. 
and they get away from everybody and everything. And we call them monks, right? In monasteries, get out of here. That's how some respond to this. That is not this, this purpose though. Why? Because the rest of chapter 12 is coming. How you live for Jesus in real life. And so what is he saying here? This is not saying you don't, you're not intended to be relevant in the world you live in. You're not intended to function in the world you live in, but you function with different ethics. You function with a different engine. What is driving you is different than what is driving the world. And, what, and when you consider our place in this world, we have to be very cautious in this imperative form, in a command form, not to let the form of this world press in on us and design who we are. Okay, let's just make this absolutely practical. If I, truly, if I am truly going to worship as a living sacrifice that refuses to be conformed to this present godless age, self-consumed age, this world, there are places I will refuse to go. <laughs> think of this. If I am not to be conformed to this world, if I'm going to live as a sacrifice, worship as a living sacrifice, there are in fact places that I will not go as a believer. There are degrading words that I will refuse to use. If I am to worship as a living sacrifice before this God, there are scenes and clips and memes and movies that I will refuse to watch because I know what they do to my heart. There are pictures, there are snaps, there are TikToks that I will refuse to post. There are websites I will refuse to go to. If I am to worship as a living sacrifice, there are songs I'll refuse to meditate on through the day because I know they are self-consumed. There are addictions I will refuse to submit to catch that. There are addictions I will refuse to submit to if I'm to worship as a living sacrifice. Do you catch what's going on here? This is absolutely practical. How do we launch into this discussion of theology with shoes on? Paul says, here's how, start with what happens up here. Don't be conformed to the self-consumed mindset of this present age. The text is clear. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The first imperative of the two, do not be conformed to this world. But that's not the whole story, is it? What is to guard us from being conformed to this world? It is the next imperative. Imperative number two, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be transformed is a very complicated word. It means to be changed. <laughs> so it's not complicated at all. In our minds, we think, oh, that's really rough. Be transformed. It's got to be something real deep in the Greek or something. No, it just means be changed. <laughs> be changed in your mind. Um, Actually, from the animal kingdom, a possible visual in your mind right now might be forming. It would be something like this. You ever seen this? Okay, this is the concept of change. Um, it's called metamorphosis. You've seen this? All right, from the caterpillar to the butterfly. It's a scientific word that comes from the same Greek word as used in this passage. Honestly, it is the same Greek word, Greek root, I should say. Is translated to be transformed. Now, in all honesty and absolute clarity, this would have most assuredly not been on Paul's mind. <laughs> I don't think as he's going through this, through this passage, he's thinking, oh yeah, butterfly. Nonetheless, when we go to this word, this gives us a, a common sense of what this is talking about. It is a change. It says a regular change that happens in our lives. And it's not a one-time thing, as we'll see right now. It is a change that is to happen every day in our life. When we are tempted to be so self-consumed, to be conformed to what this world is telling us about who we are and how important we are, we are to see our lives changed every day. 
this metamorphosis. By the way, some of you may have more interest than others in this, but this verb, be transformed, is what a little bit of a Greek lesson right here, right now on one verb, all right? Take it or leave it, but I think this really helps us understand this. There's one verb here, it's an imperative. It is the word be transformed. When you look at these these verbs in the Greek, they're gonna have a couple things that it's talking about, all right? In this verb, this one verb in the Greek, it is known as a present passive imperative, okay? What in the world does that mean? Okay, when you think about it, the fact that it is a present tense verb, that means it's ongoing, catch that. It's not a one and done thing. Be changed like the caterpillar into the butterfly and you're good. Be saved by God's grace and you're good the rest of your life. No change necessary the rest of your life. That is not this verb. It is a present, it is ongoing. Yes, you have been justified once and for all, but this change is to go on through your entire life. That is what it means to be a present Verb, a present tense verse, then the next one passive. This is, this is very good. This is a work that is being done to you, or in this case, in you. This is also what's known as an imperative mood. This is, an imperative is a what? It's a command. This is not suggested. Paul has not come to Romans chapter 12 and shared two suggestions. These are commands. Don't be conformed to this word world, but be transformed. So when you take these three things, this one Greek word, be transformed, and you see it's a present passive imperative. What does this practically mean for me? As a new covenant believer, I am commanded to be regularly open to the work that is being done to and in me. All right, class. Who is doing this work in and to me? Yes, Jesus, but specifically in Romans chapter eight, who's been introduced to us? The Holy Spirit of God is doing this work in our hearts. It is God's indwelling spirit that is transforming us each and every day. And my friends, what does the Holy Spirit of God use in our lives every single day? It is the word of God. Paul so very clearly in the book of Ephesians says the sword of the spirit, which is the what? The word of God. So when it comes into the practical day in, day out function of the spiritual life, our walk in Christ, we remember that this truly is a present tense. This is ongoing. This is a passive mood here. Voice, sorry, passive voice. That is the work that is being done to and in us. And this is an imperative mood. It is a command. So every day we're open to the regular transforming, the change that the Holy Spirit of God is doing in our hearts. And this truly is a change that is from the inside out. Think of this. If we think very practically of what's happening in the book of Romans. In many of our modern cults and world religions, the book of Romans would start with Romans chapter 12 through 15 and then continue on with the rest. Get your life all together first, and then guess what? Salvation will come. So if you were in that mindset, you would open up the book of Romans and Paul would say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the power of you unto salvation to get your life right. And then you would start with Live this way at home, live this way at church, live this way wherever you go. And then from that will come this beautiful salvation. That is the concept of a self-consumed life. I can do it, I matter most. I really can earn my salvation. The gospel is the complete opposite. We can't. This is a work of grace in our hearts. Because of this work of grace, then this work that starts on the inside and works to the outside, this work is the renewal of the mind. It is the changing of the mind. This renewal is the regular recalibrating and reprogramming of the way we think. I love those. Those are kind of more modern terms, right? Recalibration and reprogramming. (laughs) Paul wouldn't have used those. But in, in our minds, those are very appropriate. What happens when that ridiculous phone you have 
you haven't updated it in two years. You know how it's like, I hate those updates, man. Messes with all your apps and stuff like that, right? There I am complaining on Thanksgiving week. But you take this phone and you're like, man, I just updated it. And it updates again. What happens when you don't do that for an extended period of time? This thing is re- it's glitching out. You can't even receive the calls. And you try to work through this thing and do your normal work on your phone or your tablet or your computer. It doesn't work. What do you have to do? You got to reboot that thing. In some instances, when you got to have a computer, you have to reprogram this thing. Um, I love spending time in the woods. And I know there's some people in this room, some families in particular, that enjoy spending time in the woods and on the lakes and the rivers. But for me, about uh, 20 years ago now, I was on a hunt and I got super nervous. Why? A storm was coming in and I got lost. I went straight home after God helped me out of that, obviously, because I'm still here. I went home and one of the first things I purchased after that was a GPS unit, a global positioning unit where you can find where you're at there and you can reprogram it. I mean, you can you change your steps based on this GPS unit. However, if any of you have used GPS units, every once in a while, what do you have to do to this thing? You have to recalibrate it. Have you turn it over this way, turn it over this way, turn it all, and finally, after like five minutes of doing this, you're like, oh, that's where I need to go. It's recalibrating. My friends, in a modern sense, this is what this concept is talking about. Be changed by the recalibration of your mind. Be changed by the reprogramming of your mind every single day. It's not just once. This transformation is to happen every day of our lives, every moment of every day. Present, passive, imperative, right? Well, I love what one commentator says. Christians are to adjust their way of thinking about everything in accordance with the newness of, the, of their life in the spirit. This reprogramming, he actually uses this word, I love it. This reprogramming of the mind does not take place overnight, but is a lifelong process by which our way of thinking is to resemble more and more the way God wants us to think. Practically, my friends, What does this look like for you and for me? To be transformed in our minds, we must be saturated in the what? Word. I'm gonna say that as 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 clear as I can. To be transformed in our minds, we must be saturated in the word. Everything about our lives, we seek to line it up directly with God's holy word. This would incline us to be in God's word every single day. I've stated this on several different occasions, but this actually is one of those mottos of my life. One of, another one of my mentors would say this regularly. We spend time in God's word, not as a demonstration of how disciplined we are, but in a declaration of how dependent we are. Every day we need God and his word. We don't need our minds to be shaped by the latest popular hip-hop song or social media influencer or most dynamic sports figure or most articulate news anchor, especially in political seasons. My friends, what do we need? Every moment of every day, we need God's word to shape our minds. So, by way of review, how do, how do we worship as living sacrifices? How do we do it? Don't be conformed to this word, world. Don't take on the form of this self-conformed world. But the adverse, the positive, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the reprogramming of your mind every single day. Now, Paul doesn't end the discussion with just that, though. These two imperatives, I love this because he talks about the purpose. What is the purpose of all of this? What is the purpose of these two verses? This is so good. Okay, before we even get into this, how many books have you come across in the last 10 years, even in Christian circles, telling you to find your purpose? What what is God's will for my life? 
I remember as a, a high school student just almost fretting about this, being anxious about this. What does God have for my life? What is God's will for my life? What is the purpose of my life? And I remember having a camp counselor sit down with me and says, Andrew, God's word, when it talks about his will, is almost exclusively talking about the present right now. Live for God right now. Find your purpose right now. Obey God right now. And he will show you one step at a time. Well, that's what this is talking about. How are we going to find our purpose for our existence? How are we going to find out why we're on this earth? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then Paul says this, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. He's not hiding it here. You want to know what the will of God is? Follow these directives. What is good and acceptable and perfect. The purpose of all of this is that we would prove that God's good, acceptable, and perfect will is being lived out in us every single day. That we are living lives in line with God's plan for transformed believers. How cool is that? that you're living a life that you can honestly say, that brings a smile to my God. This is the way he designed it. I mean, if you think of biblical theology, that's the story of the entire Bible. God created Eden. God created male and female, placed them in Eden. A beautiful existence they had with pure relationship with God. Sin marred that, right? But then God and his grace promised the Messiah, Jesus, the rescuer would put this back together. And so the rest of your Bibles, you find that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And what will this Jesus do? He will redeem the image of God in man. This is so good. Then through the new covenant, we find that this image through the dwelling Holy Spirit has been transformed. It has been changed. We now have relationship with this God. Oh, but brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not the rest of the story. We still live in this broken world, and in this broken world, what are we to do? We are to worship. Everywhere we go, with anyone and everyone, we are to worship. We are to push, promote. We are to put this God on display. Why? Because this is God's plan. This is God's will, his perfect will for your life. Put God on display. Let's close out with a so what. Two weeks we spent on these two verses. Paul very clearly says, you are to worship as living sacrifices. How to do this? You are to not take on the form of this self-consumed world but you are to be changed by the reprogramming of your mind every day that you might prove God's will for your life, your purpose in this life, so what? I don't want to overcomplicate this today. I just want to ask the same question as we did last week. Are you, my friend, a living sacrifice to this God? If you want to say it just a bit different, change some of the wording. Are you living as a sacrifice to God? Today. Are you living as a sacrifice to God? Clearly, it is impossible to be a living sacrifice to God without first placing repentant faith in Jesus Christ. Catch this. You cannot daily live as a sacrifice if you have not been born again, the scripture says. If a relationship has not been started. So I want to encourage anyone here today. If you've never come to Jesus Christ in repentant faith. If you've never initially been placed on the altar. Saying God use me. Do whatever you want with me. God I am yours. Save my soul. My friend if you've never done that. Would today be that day? Would you come to Jesus and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? I remember as a 10 year old boy. I share this often because it was the greatest day of my life. As a 10-year-old young man, hearing the sermons, I mean, dad, my dad preached all the time, and I, to this day, I remember sitting in the back row, and he was preaching on this salvation. 
and it came together. God, the Holy Spirit, brought it together in my mind. And I knew I must respond in repentant faith to see this relationship happen by God's grace. My friend, that is the best day of my entire life. And if you've never come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, would today, this very day, November 20th, 2022, would this day be the day when you come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ? If you have come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, my question is this, are you living as a sacrifice to this God? Young people, are you living as a sacrifice to this God? Are you refusing to take the shape of this self-consumed age, this world around you, and are you being daily transformed? Are you truly being reprogrammed? We're talking about regular sacrifices. Where and when? We're talking about at home. Oh, one of the hardest places to worship as a living sacrifice is in the confines of your own home. Do you live as a sacrifice to God at home? What about at work? What about at school? What about on the sports field? What about in your cars, on your phones, when nobody's watching, on your computers in that dark room, on your TV? With our tempers, are we living as sacrifices to God? With our flesh, with our desires, Practically, we are talking about being non-conformed, mind-transformed sacrifices every single day when that coworker, that classmate encourages you to lie. No, I can't. Why? Because I'm a living sacrifice. It's not me. <laughs> I'm a living sacrifice. When that friend encourages you to partake of that substance that you know you've been struggle with addictions towards. No, I can't do it. Why? Because I'm a living sacrifice. When that picture, that video pops up on your phone, no, I won't look at it. Why? Because I'm a living sacrifice. When that premarital, premarital romantic situation begins to take a serious turn, nope. I am a living sacrifice. When that coworker starts to persuade you to doubt your affections for your spouse, nope. I am a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I will close with this. This week I found myself singing a song that we sang last Sunday morning. Some of you may have caught this song. This is a song I was singing last week and it continued on into this week. I love this song because it was written by a pastor's child. A pastor's daughter, nonetheless. She heard it all. She knew all the theology. She came to a place in her life where she realized it was more than just playing games. It was more than just going through the motions. It was living a life of sacrifice for this God. Her name was Frances Havergill. Even though I don't appreciate all of her theological conclusions, I do appreciate some of her very particular songs. And one of them says this. Uh, in the mid-1800s, she wrote this. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee, Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands. Let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet. Let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice. Let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips. Let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver, my gold. Not a mite will I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet thy, its treasure store. Take myself, everything, 
and I will be ever only all for thee. My friends, can you pray that? In line with what Paul says here, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your logical worship. Do not take the shape of this world, but be regularly reprogrammed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So God, that is the prayer of our hearts in line with this passage. Our fathers, we launch into this section of very practical ways we live out our relationship with you. God, I pray that our minds would be set. As Paul says to the church of Colossae, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. Oh God, I pray that you would give us grace to live this way. We understand as we found in Romans chapter 8, Romans 6 through 8, that this is a day in, day out battle. Thank you, God, for the inner transformation that you've placed in us, the Holy Spirit, the transformer. And I pray, God, that we would be obedient to every impulse of the Spirit through the Word, we pray. My friends here today, I want to thank you for your attentiveness as you've, we've walked through this text. These are very, very familiar verses. But I would encourage you as we close out our time today, as we close out with a couple brief moments of prayer, that you would ask God to help you see this passage fresh. That in the broken world we live in right now, that you would be consumed with living, worshiping as a living sacrifice for this God. And so God, we pray to that end. We pray that we would worship as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to you, which is our logical worship. Thank you for the time we could spend in your word today. Bless as we go our way today and we walk into these connection groups. Give us grace to know how to bring application to these things. Bless us as we go our way this afternoon and come back this evening for some fellowship. I pray, God, that you would be honored and glorified through the body of believers at Cross Point Community Church, we pray. It is in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.